welcome to today's launch program on this Wednesday, September 16th. Glad that you could join us whenever that time might be, whether it's in the afternoon or maybe even in the morning or later in the day or week. God bless you. Here is a question for us to ponder. I'll give you the answer at the end. What was the name of the chief priest who put Jesus on trial? The name of the chief priest who put Jesus on trial. And now for some good humor. Rachel, do you know the difference between daddy's toys and our brother's toys? Fran, yeah, daddy's cost a lot more money. <laughs> Here's another one. Which way did the programmer go? He went data way. Get it, data? Now that probably doesn't work if you're like me and you say data. Data way doesn't work, but data way does. Yes, a different sort of joke there, right? Now let's jump into our passage for today, Ecclesiastes 9, 5 through 10. For the living know that they will die, but the dead know nothing. They have no further reward. Even their name is forgotten. Their love, their hate, and their jealousy have long since vanished. Never again will they have a part in anything that happens under the sun. Go, eat your food with gladness, and drink your wine with a joyful heart, for God has already approved what you do. Always be clothed in white, and always anoint your head with oil. Enjoy life with your wife, whom you love, all the days of this meaningless life that God has given us under the sun. All your meaningless days. For this is your lot in life, and in your toilsome labor under the sun. Whatever your hand finds to do, do it with all your might. For in the realm of the dead, where you are going, there is neither working, nor planning, nor knowledge, nor wisdom. Golly, if we wanted something to be sad about, all we'd have to do is read Ecclesiastes. Wouldn't you agree? The saddest thing about it, though, is a man who is searching for meaning and not finding it. Here's what I think. I think that Solomon's big issue was, with all of his wisdom, he could not see into the next world. And that really troubled him. It troubled him greatly. He didn't know what awaited him. And if he thought he knew what was there, he was mistaken. Now, we can't fully fault Solomon for this, because less was known about the afterlife or heaven then in the Old Testament than since the New Testament. For the Old Testament person, the afterlife was more or less a shadowy existence, um, largely an unknown, perhaps nothing more than the uh, life of a ghost or an apparition. So he goes back to what he does know. Eat, drink, be glad. Enjoy your spouse. That's the best you can do because that's it. Such a fatalistic approach, wouldn't you say? Again, we have a far better understanding of heaven thanks to Jesus and thanks to the New Testament. Hear these words from Jesus. Whoever keeps my commandments and teaches others to do so will be called great in the kingdom of heaven, Matthew 519. Peter, a disciple of Jesus, wrote, But according to his promise, we are waiting for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. 2 Peter 3.13 The anonymous author of Hebrews stated, For here we have no lasting city, but we seek the city that is to come. Then we get this more comprehensive information from another disciple of Jesus, John, who wrote in Revelation, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, 
and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with humanity. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more, neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain any more, for the former things have passed away. And he who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. Also he said, Write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, bright as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb through the middle of the street of the city. Also on either side of the river, the tree of life with its twelve kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit each month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be anything accursed, but the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it, and his servants will worship him. They will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads, and night will be no more. They will need no light of lamp or sun, for the Lord God will be their light, and they will reign forever and ever. Paul stated, if more was given, we couldn't comprehend it. That's what he meant when he wrote, what no eye has seen, no ear has heard, nor the heart of humanity imagined. Indeed, what God has prepared for those who love him. Solomon, in all of his wisdom, could not have known any of the above, or perhaps because of his departure from God, was not given further revelation. So his wisdom failed him looking beyond this life, and his faith failed him because he didn't continue to listen to the voice of God, to follow the precepts of God. Yet Solomon closes this section with an interesting observation. Hebrews, excuse me, Ecclesiastes 9, verses 13 through 18. I also saw under the sun this example of wisdom that greatly impressed me. There was once a small city with only a few people in it, and a powerful king came against it, surrounded it, and built huge siege works against it. Now there lived in that city a man poor but wise, and he saved the city by his wisdom. But nobody remembered that poor man. So I said, Wisdom is better than strength. But the poor man's wisdom is despised, and his words are no longer heeded. The quiet words of the wise are more to be heeded than the shouts of a ruler of fools. Wisdom is better than weapons of war, but one sinner destroys much good. Solomon, here at the end of this chapter, witnessed something that impressed him. Himself a man full of wisdom, impressed by another wise man, who saved an entire city. Maybe Solomon's forces were in play here, or maybe he witnessed another power at work. He was deeply moved both by the wisdom of this poor man and by the fact that the wise man would be lost in time, not remembered for his great wisdom, something that bothered himself about his own outcome. And then he talks about this need to contend with the destruction of a broken world and a broken people. It's a fact of life. Better to understand it sooner than later. How fortunate for us that the best is yet to come, regardless of what happens now. Whether through sin or natural disaster or through illness or weakness, God is with us in the midst of a pandemic as much as any other time. God never leaves us, never forsakes us through Christ. Let's pray. Thank you, God, for 
giving us the ability to experience life with the knowledge of the New Testament, the words of Christ and Peter and John, inspired by you so that we could be inspired, so that we could have hope, so that we could know that you're in control and the best is yet to come. In the meantime, help us to trust, keep us safe, guide us and direct us, lead us, help us to follow. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. And now for our trivia question answer. What was the name of the chief priest who put Jesus on trial? It was Caiaphas. His full name was Joseph ben Caiaphas. Ben means of Joseph, son of Caiaphas, but the name of his father stuck. We know him from the New Testament and from the writings of Josephus. He was appointed as high priest in 18 AD by the Roman governor of Judea. Therefore, his primary interest or maybe his main allegiance was to the pro-Roman state more than to the duties of high priest. There was some ambivalence, to say the least. And there maybe is a new one to know. Indeed, he figured into God's plan, was used of God, even in a difficult situation, an enemy of Christ, yet one who was part of God's great, wonderful plan of salvation. Christ's death has given us new life. and For that, we're always grateful. Take care. Looking forward to seeing you next time. God bless.